Hello dear students, at the outset I would like to congratulate all of you. I know it's been a long journey, it's been a tough journey with all the preponements, the postponements, the change in the exam pattern, the change in the exam centers also. But finally the day is done, it's time to kick back and relax. Now at the outset I did speak to a lot of students and the vibe that I got from them or the input that I got from them was that this particular NEET PG 2024, both the sessions, session 1 and session 2, had a lot of image based questions and what put them off was the fact that most of these images were not clinical images but they were of radiology based images. Now as undergraduate students, normally you guys are not exposed to these radiology based questions either in your clinical postings or in your final year exam as well and that is what kind of put most of them off. But I did go through the questions and if you looked at it a bit carefully, majority of these images were adjuncts to some sort of information which was already given in the stem of the question. So it was kind of an integrated question like either uh, OBG and radiology, surgery and radiology, medicine and radiology. So that's how it was. Pure radiology questions were not that many. So if you paid a little bit attention to the stem of the question, you would have been able to crack these answers and I'm sure majority of you have already done that. Now I have a disclaimer to make. Now the questions that I've covered in this recall session, I have got it from various sources. I've spoken to a lot of students and then I have made a collection and I've put it up. There may be few errors when it comes to the language of the question, the options and the way the options are arranged as well. Now I will give you my justification as to why I think that particular option was the correct answer of course with obvious references and I hope it helps you. So at the outset uh, I am Dr. Nishant Lakshmi Kanta and I will be covering all the general surgery recall questions from NEET PG 2024 both from session 1 and session 2. So let's start off. Now the first question was pretty straightforward. This was of a patient with a umbilical hernia. They have said that they had given a patient and the reason why the diagnosis was straightforward was that they told that it was completely reducible. Initially it was painless and reducible, then gradually the patient started complaining of pain, it became irreducible and in the image what they had given they also mentioned that apparently there was a little bit of discoloration of the skin overlying the hernia. Now this kind of indirectly suggests that it is some sort of strangulated hernia. And we know that whenever we are dealing with strangulated hernia or any hernia where the skin is excoriated or badly infected, we do not put a mesh. We do not put a mesh. Now because the hernia, some sort of hernia repair has to be done. If you look at the options, umbilectomy basically means you're going to remove off all the dead skin, but that alone is not sufficient because you still have to tackle the hernia. So the correct answer would have been an umbilectomy with herniorephy. Alright, so this would have been the correct answer for this particular question. Of course, we do not do an IND or we don't give antibiotics alone for the management of a umbilical hernia. Now, this was again a question which a radiology image had been put up and a lot of students kind of panicked because they hadn't seen that image before. And if you look at this, there were two obvious glaring clues that were given in the stem of the question and the image per se. Now, the first clue that they had mentioned in the stem of the question was that it was a six week old child, it was not a newborn. And we have told this n number of time in our classes, in congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, the symptoms do not start at birth, they start slightly later, roughly around four to six weeks. So that was the first clue that they had given that it was a six week old child. And they had mentioned that the patient had repeated episodes of vomiting. And what was even obvious was the fact that they had mentioned it was a USG image. Or if you even look at the image, you know that it is that of an ultrasound. Now look at the options here. Congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis was the obvious answer. But if you look at the other options, volvulus, duodenal atresia, annular pancreas, none of these three are options where you are going to use ultrasound. Okay. If you look at it, volvulus is diagnosed on an erect x-ray. You don't expect this in a child in the first place. Duodenal atresia, again you are going to find a double bubble sign, again this is on an x-ray. Annular pancreas also you will have a double bubble sign, again this is also on an x-ray. Now 
if you're going to have duodenal atresia and annular pancreas which have similar findings on an x-ray so both these options are ruled out and volvulus also i told you you need some sort of ct or an x-ray and not an ultrasound so two glaring clues six week old child and the fact that it was an ultrasound should have given it right away that the diagnosis was that of a congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis next question patient with fever pain in the right hypochondrium and they had given an image of an ultrasound or a ct we don't know which of the two images they had given students were a bit confused and they directly asked you what is the garby classification or what is the subtype of garby classification used so indirect hinting that this was a patient with hydatid cyst now this was an out and out radiology question because they gave you the image and they're asking you to identify what the subtype is now here you can see that there are detached membranes the daughter cyst has kind of got detached from the parent cyst and it is kind of freely floating now this is called as the water lily sign now water lily sign is classified as type 2 under garby classification but what was surprising is that normally they ask you the who classification which is what is being used recently now in who classification it's a bit different there it comes under 3 whereas in garby it's type 2 so if they have mentioned garby classification in the stem then the answer is pretty straightforward it is type 2 so no confusion in that regard now moving on this was another question which was um, question where they had given you a clue in the stem and they had given you a radiology image and then asked you a question based on it. Now here they said that the patient had sustained a road traffic accident. X-ray of the chest was given and the question that they had asked was what is the type of breathing that you expect to see in this patient. Now if you look at the X-ray you can see that there are multiple segments of ribs that have been fractured. All right. So this is a case of flail chest. And we all know that in frail chest, one segment of the rib is completely detached from the rib cage. So whenever the patient breathes in, normally we expect the rib cage to expand, whereas this segment which has got detached will go in and thereby it gives a paradoxical movement as compared to the rest of the rib cage. So this particular patient will have paradoxical respiration. Okay, paradoxical respiration or paradoxical movement. This is what is seen in a patient with a flail chest. Now, the rest of the scenarios, be it Biot's breathing, the Kusumal's cane strokes, you don't expect to see all this in a case of RTA. If it is seen in RTA, it is usually associated with head injury. They will not give you an X-ray of the chest at that point of time. Moving forward, this was another question where they had put up an image. This was on aortic dissection. So what they did is they gave an image of an aorta with the ascending the arch of aorta, the descending aorta, they gave you the image of the dissection and they asked what was the initial line of management. Now the image what has been given here is that of Stanford type 2 or B classification and Debeke type 3. Okay, Debeke type 3. Now this Stanford classification, the idea is to see whether the ascending iota is involved or not. So if ascending iota is involved, it's going to become Stanford A. If ascending iota is not involved, then it's going to become Stanford B. Now if you see in this image here, ascending iota is clear. There is no dissection in the ascending iota. So this automatically becomes Stanford B type of classification. Now in this Stanford B, the initial line of treatment is to manage these patients conservatively with beta blockers and close monitoring of the vitals and very very rarely you need to operate on these patients with the help of either a stent or a bypass surgery that is in very few cases wherever you expect vascular compromise okay vascular compromise to the abdominal organs and stuff like that only then would you choose to do some sort of procedure in the form of a stenting or in the form of a bypass surgery. Now, if it is Stanford A classification, now I told you, right, this is Stanford A. Remember, A for ascending aorta and this is Stanford B. Now, if the ascending aorta is involved, such as Stanford A classification, 
then the initial line of management is to do some sort of intervention and the preferred modality is a open bypass surgery okay so that was about aortic dissection next was a out and out image based question i have told this n number of times upper gi hemorrhage you will get image based questions okay and i have covered this in our modules we have put up multiple images and it was a straight question out of the lecture and onto the question paper in this particular scenario so they had given an image of a upper gi endoscopy where they showed you the lower end of the esophagus and they asked you what the scenario was there were some dilated veins that you could see in the lower end and the diagnosis was pretty obvious in this scenario the diagnosis was that of esophageal varices now in barrett's esophagus you're going to see that the line will move higher up all right this comma columnar junction will move higher up that means proximal into the esophagus you're going to have a red velvety mucosa that was not shown in that particular image gastric erosions and esophageal candidiasis are completely different entity gastric erosions you need to see the stomach but here the image was that of the esophagus and in esophageal candidiasis you're going to have white white spots everywhere you're going to have white spots which was again not seen here so this was a straightforward question um, nothing much to discuss here this was slightly tricky this particular question so here what they had done is they had given an image of a patient who's undergone some sort of surgery for the oral cavity and even a flap surgery all right so even a reconstruction was done a petralis major myocutaneous flap and the question that they had asked is which of the following is an indication for giving adjuvant radiotherapy that means the surgery is done reconstruction is done following that what are the indications of giving radiotherapy now this was a bit tricky although i had covered it in our modules but there were two or three options which were quite close and a bit confusing now t3 is a kind of an indication for starting radiotherapy lymph node metastasis close margin and extra nodal extension now in this scenario i felt the best answer was extra nodal extension now justification for choosing that particular option was although we had mentioned t3 t4 positive margins not close margins positive margins extra nodal extension lymph node metastasis presence of lymphovascular and perineural involvement but if you look at the paragraph from bailey and love now there they have categorized it as major criteria and minor criteria now in major criteria extra nodal extension and involved margins involved margins that means positive not close margins so based on this i would have preferred to choose what is the major criteria that is a extra nodal extension and not any of the other options so this was a bit tricky this one particular question was what we call a googly or a dusra that they had put in this particular neat pg in general surgery now again this was a radiology based question and then they directed it towards surgery so they had given an image of a patient where you can see there is some sort of stent inside the ureter one end in the kidney and the other end inside the bladder so this was a dj stent dj stent dj stands for double j stent that's cause it looks like a j from top if you draw it like this and again if you draw from down it looks like another j that's why, that's the reason it's called as a double j stent it's a self retaining stent now the question that they had asked is what is the instrument or the technique that you are going to use to insert that's all the question was to insert if you look now i know this is a bit confusing for you guys because common sense says that if it is in the ureter the instrument that is going to be used is a ureteroscope now that is where this is a bit tricky uh, it's like you're going to a post box you're seeing an opening in the post box and you just want to put the letter you don't have to open the post box and put the letter you just need to see the opening so if you use the same analogy into the urinary bladder all you have to do is go inside the bladder and look at the opening and push the stent okay you don't have to go inside the ureter leave the stent and come back if you see the opening it's enough you will be able to insert the stent so you just need to see the bladder and the instrument that we use to see the bladder is that of a cystoscope 
Now, if you see, there was only one option where cysto was mentioned. That was a cystourethroscope. There's a little bit of confusion where students said it was cystourethroscope. That means there are certain scopes which we, through which you can see the bladder and in the same camera, you can go higher up and even look into the ureter as well. So if cystourethroscope was there, that would be the best answer. Otherwise also, cystourethroscope is still a better answer as compared to a ureteroscope personally. So ureteroscope, the indication will be some sort of surgery inside the ureter. Okay, either if you want to do a basketing or you want to use laser or you want to break down the stones, a lithotripsy, only then you're going to use a ureteroscope. Otherwise, a cystoscope is sufficient. Next question that was asked was, again, an image-based question. They gave you an image of the leg of a patient with a nice red color superficial wound. Now, two points to be noted. If it was red, that means it is healthy. And the second was that it is a superficial wound. Now, in this scenario, because it is superficial and it is in a non-cosmetically sensitive area, like for example, in the leg, you're not too worried about cosmosis. But if it's on the face, you're very much worried about cosmosis. So the reason why I'm talking about cosmosis here is that we use a full thickness graft in cosmetically sensitive areas like the face. So if you're going to use a full thickness skin graft, it should be over the face. Remember F for F. Otherwise, anywhere else, the option would have been to use a split thickness skin graft. Flap surgeries is when a lot of tissue is deficient and a vac dressing is when you have a lot of necrosis and when you have a deep wound. Now, a lot of students got confused. They wanted to put a vac dressing as against a skin graft. Now, if you look at the comparison between these two images here, you can see it is nice, red and healthy. Here, there is a lot of slough. You can see white color slough and it's a bit deep. It is not a superficial wound. So, this is a scenario where you would prefer to use a VAC dressing. And the other one where you're going to use a split thickness skin graft. Next was an again an image based question. I couldn't get hold of the image. They said that it was an intraoperative image where they could see some sort of feculent discharge from the umbilicus. There was a feculent discharge from the umbilicus and intraop they had held some sort of tubular structure from the small intestine. Now what I could get from that particular description was that they were probably holding the Meckel's diverticulum or something similar. Now, whenever the umbilicus has some sort of patent communication with the intestine, we are going to call this condition as a patent vitello intestinal tract or an intestinal duct. Now, we talk about uracus only if it is communicating with the bladder, with the urinary bladder. In this scenario, it was the intestine and that you could see fecal and discharge. So, it was a pretty straightforward answer where you had to choose a patent vitello intestinal duct or a patent vitello intestinal tract. Now, again, this was an uh, image based question outright. Again, this also we have told n number of times. Very common question. I've even put up this image in our module. Now, they give an image of a bed sore and asked you to grade that particular bed sore. Now, remember, whenever you can see muscle or bone, very simple. If you can see muscle or bone, if it's gone to that level, then this it becomes a grade 4 bed sore. Okay, grade 4 bed sore. First one is just erythema, non-blanchable erythema. Two is if the skin is involved. Three is if it is subcutaneous. Four is if it involves the muscle or the bone. In this scenario, you can actually see this scar, which has gone up to the level of the muscle and even probably up to the bone underneath. We don't know. But either way, this will become type 4 or classification 4 of bed sore. This was again a slightly tricky question. Now, I am getting um, two or three descriptions of the images from the students. Now, let's first look at the question. What they said that there was a patient who presented with a breast lump. Okay. And what everyone confirmed was that there was an ulcer. Okay. There was a breast lump. There was an ulcer. Next point was that this patient had liver mets liver mets 
if it is ca breast automatically it is going to go into stage 4 other said there were some bosselated appearance they felt it was malignant phyloids and the question was what is the best line of management for this patient now if you remember let's first talk about ca breast if you remember management you have to classify them as early breast cancer advanced locally advanced breast cancer and finally advanced breast cancer now early breast first is surgery followed by adjuvant treatment in locally advanced breast cancer first is new adjuvant treatment and that is followed by surgery and advanced breast cancer means whenever you have metastasis or stage 4 okay here the only role is palliation now if this was an advanced breast cancer and not phyllodes tumor then the option would have been to do a toilet mastectomy that would have been the best answer now the reason why somebody does a toilet mastectomy a toilet mastectomy is so that if you take out this ulcer then there will be less bleeding less amount of foul smelling discharge at least the quality of the patient will improve you're not looking at treatment at this point of time once there is metastasis so automatically the other options go out of the window see modified radical mastectomy you're not going to do radical mastectomy you're not going to do because you don't even want to touch the lymph nodes let alone the pectoralis major muscle new adjuvant therapy i told you is reserved for locally advanced breast cancer now if it is already stage 4 with a fungating growth that means it's already gone beyond your capacity to help that particular patient so do something that is in line with palliation now the only option here which kind of fell into that category was a simple mastectomy that means just remove the breast come out improve the quality of the patient now if this was let us say malignant phyllodes tumor i wouldn't have expected them to give either of these three options because all these three options are reserved for ca breast not for phyllodes tumor so even if it's phyllodes tumor the answer will be to do a simple mastectomy again this was a bit of a controversial question uh, because of the information that i got from the students some students said it was a hairy bottom there were a lot of hairs few said that they could see the anal opening in the image and of course the fact that there was a sinus opening as well now what put off students was because they saw hair there the first option was that it could have been a pylonidal sinus and if you can see the anal opening that means you are near the perianal region so then the answer would have been a fistula in anal two other things that you need to pay attention to is that to examine a pylonidal sinus the patient must be in prone position you put them completely onto their belly and then look at it because majority of their openings are in the natal cleft that means higher up near the sacrum all right whereas a perianal fistula or a fistula in ano you need to put the patient either like what i've shown here in the lithotomy position or in the sims position this is the sims position the patient uh, the patient's position in this particular image is a lateral sims position and you can see that there are multiple discharging sinuses here and you can see the anal opening so in this particular image the answer is fistula and ano but if they had given you an image of a lithotomy we do not examine pylonidal sinus in lithotomy position simple common sense because lithotomy is very embarrassing for the patient and it is only done on table for surgery pylonidal sinus cannot be operated with lithotomy position so if you have seen the anal opening or if you have seen lithotomy position or anything depicting that then the correct answer will be a fistula in ano or if you see a natal cleft and higher up that means somewhere in the lower back region and they have shown you the opening then the option will be pylonidal sinus hair in that area can be a little confusing but that is not the only thing to be looked at this was a image of a patient where i think they had shown a patient with penile carcinoma and they had asked you how do you manage this but they had specifically given two extra bits of information one was that this was a t3 lesion and second that there were no enlarged inguinal lymph nodes all right so it was just straightforward t3 
T3 penile cancer involving the tip of the penis and that there were no palpable lymph nodes. Now, there was no partial penectomy, total penectomy. So, that confusion is out of the window. So, automatically, penectomy was the first part of the treatment and that was given all the four options. Now, the confusion which the students had was whether it is only penectomy or whether it is penectomy with deep inguinal lymph node dissection or a ilio inguinal lymph node dissection. Orchidectomy is not done and there is nothing called superficial inguinal lymph node dissection. What is there is something called as the modified modified inguinal lymph node dissection. Even in modified inguinal dissection, you will be removing the deep inguinal nodes. It is just that the boundaries have changed, all right? But the deep inguinal lymph nodes are still removed. So modified does not mean superficial inguinal lymph node dissection. There is nothing called a superficial inguinal lymph node dissection. So this is out of the window, all right? These two options are out. The confusion was between penectomy and with inguinal lymph node dissection. Now I've told you whenever there are no lymph nodes palpable, you have to do a SLNB. That is a sentinel lymph node biopsy. But in certain high risk features, you have to go ahead and do a inguinal lymph node dissection. I had mentioned this in my lecture because of course I had referred a lot of urology books when we did that. But if for giving references, I need to have proper standard books or standard references that I need to tell you. Now in Bailey and Lau, there is no mention about this at all. So I opened the NCCN classification, which is like the gold standard for oncology management. So here they have clearly said that management of non-palpable inguinal lymph nodes, if it is anything which is T1B, T2, T3 or T4, you have to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy. If that is not available, go ahead and directly do a inguinal lymph node dissection. So answer in this particular scenario is, will be penectomy with deep inguinal lymph node dissection or the ilio inguinal lymph node dissection. Next was an image of a patient who's undergone an amputation. Now the image what I have put up is post-op, but I think the image that was given was that of an intraoperative image, an intraop image. Now in that particular image, two things, I think there were two bones and there was a long posterior flap. long posterior flap. Now both of these point towards a below knee amputation. If it's an above knee amputation, then you will only see one bone and equal flaps. Equal flaps. Both anterior and posterior flaps will be equal. But if it is a below knee amputation, like you can see in this image, the posterior flap will come from the back, come all the way to the front and you're going to stitch it up. So this was an image of a Belloni amputation what had been given in the exam. Liz Frank, Chopard, these are all of foot amputations. So automatically these two options were ruled out. This was a repeat question, okay, straightforward repeat question. I think they had mentioned that the patient was elderly, there was history of trauma, but there was a little confusion as to whether it was three weeks back or seven days back. Either way, it doesn't matter because it is not one or two days. If it is one or two days, then automatically your head should go towards extra dural hemorrhage because of the concept called as lucid interval. Okay. One or two days means think about EDH. Whereas if they say elderly, long duration, that means between the injury and the time that they've presented, then think of chronic SDH. So we have repeated this n number of times. This was even asked in the recent INI CET. All right. So this was a pretty straightforward repeat question from last time. They had even given you a CT finding of a lesion like this. So this is commonly seen. This is a concavo convex lesion. This is commonly seen in SDH. And there were certain students who even told me that the option itself said chronic SDH. If that is there, then that is the best answer for this particular question. Next was an image of a child with a cleft lip and a cleft palate. Okay. And the question that was asked was, when is the earliest possible management 
possible for this particular condition and Bailey and Love clearly states that the first repair is that of the cleft lip and this is going to start at 3 to 6 months. 3 to 6 months. Okay, it's called as a Millard's repair. It starts at 3 to 6 months. There is something called rule of 10 associated with it. Okay, so these two points are mentioned in Bailey and Love. 10 kg weight, then you have to wait for 10 weeks, 10 grams of hemoglobin and only then you are going to operate on the child. Now, earliest means I will automatically take the lower value of this. So no, it doesn't make sense for me to choose the higher value. The question was earliest possible. So the answer here is 3 months. Okay, this is mentioned in Bailey. So pretty straightforward, no more confusion regarding this particular question. Next, they gave you a image of a child or a young teenage boy. And this was an intraoperative image where they had shown the testis. Intraoperative image. Now that should give you the clue. All right. If you looked at the options, options were testicular torsion, torsion of testicular appendage, testicular hematoma, testicular cyst. Now of these four options, these three are managed conservatively. You do not explore the patient. That's all I'm telling. Simple common sense. Don't even get carried away with the image. For these three procedures or these three conditions, sorry, you are not going to explore or do any sort of surgery. The choice is a conservative management. Only testicular torsion you are going to explore and you are going to detort the testis or do an orchidectomy if it's a strangulated or a non-viable testis. So here the answer was testicular torsion. Certain students got confused with the fact that there was a testicular appendage to torsion which is mentioned in the option. Now, if you remember, I've mentioned this n number of times. This presents with what we call as a blue dot sign that you're going to see over the scrotum. One small blue dot will be there. And all you have to do is just manage them conservatively with some amount of painkillers and antibiotics. And that will take care of the job. You do not need to operate on these patients. All right. None of these three options are where you are going to operate on them. Next was a radiology based image we have covered this when we have done uh, our urology module here they said that there was a child with recurrent urinary burning sensation or some sort of recurrent uti that was happening the micturating cystourethrogram was given you can see here that there is a bladder opening of the urethra and the first part of the urethra is bulged okay and after that there is narrowing that means there is something inside the urethra which is preventing the flow of urine. Okay. Now this condition is that of a posterior urethral valve. Now this was pretty straightforward. The answer would be to do a endoscopic ablation of the valve. Endoscopic ablation of the valve. That is the correct answer for this particular question. I hope this was pretty straightforward. The only trick was to identify the condition. Okay. If you have identified the condition, rest of it will become easy. Next was again another question from urology. They said that a patient presented with repeated episodes of sterile pus. Sorry, the patient had repeated episodes of sterile pyuria or sterile pus coming out in the urine. And on performing cystoscopy, they gave an image where there was a small opening, okay, small opening or narrow opening of the ureter. Now, this is called as a golf hole ureter. Okay, that's called as a golf hole ureter. Now, how do you correlate this? Why is it called golf hole? Why can't it be called as a basketball hoop? Basketball hoop is big, right? But here it's become narrow, it's become small and this is typically seen in renal tuberculosis. Alright, renal tuberculosis, this is typically seen in renal tuberculosis. So that was the question that was asked. It was that of a golf hole ureter. Now the other point which suggested that this is renal TB was that the patient had repeated episodes of sterile pus or pyuria. Now the other findings that are found in renal tuberculosis, we have put up this image, we have discussed this. Starting from the kidney, you can either have a cement kidney or a putty kidney. Going down into the renal pelvis, you can have the Kerr's kink. Lower down where it joins the bladder, you can have the golf hole ureter. In the bladder per se, you're going to get the thimble bladder. Okay. 
all these are changes associated with renal tuberculosis next question again this was an image based question that was slightly tricky but the clue to this was to look at the nerve structure all right or the way the nerve was running so they gave an image of the axilla correct and they asked they labeled one particular nerve and asked you what is the structure now the reason i'm confident it's a nerve is because that all the other options were nerves so it couldn't have been anything else now if you look at the axilla you're going to have your latissimus dorsi here you're going to have the pectoralis major and this is the serratus anterior here lies the clue now the confusion was whether it was long thoracic nerve or whether it is the median pectoral nerve remember the long thoracic nerve runs longitudinally and it lies on the serratus anterior whereas the median pectoral nerve the i think the reason why they were asking is that it is the median pectoral nerve which runs on the lateral border of the pectoralis muscle okay that is the reason why they keep on asking this particular question to see whether you have understood otherwise normally our thought process is if it's median pectoral nerve it should be on the medial aspect of the pectoralis muscle why is it coming on the lateral aspect okay so i think it was the median pectoral nerve because some students told me it was running perpendicular to the muscle all right it was running perpendicular to the pectoralis muscle okay so this was the median pectoral nerve and if it had run longitudinally then the answer will be long thoracic nerve but based on what information i have got i think the image that was showed was that of a median pectoral nerve again this is one thing where there was a lot of confusion they told that this was image of a child who was undergoing a herniotomy and they had shown some venous structure and they asked them to identify what that venous structure was now two or three options are directly ruled out femoral vein is ruled out obturator vein is ruled out because we do not go near these structures at all okay these structures are not even accessed especially when you are doing a herniotomy so that leaves us with two options whether it was a testicular vein or whether it was a inferior epigastric vein if the vein was along with the cord structures in that particular image if it was along with the cord structures and it was anterior to the sac then your answer is that of a testicular vein but if it was posterior on the abdominal wall which they have spread and they are showing you a linear structure like this then that will become the inferior epigastric vein but a lot of students said that it was a small vein and it was very closely related to the cord structures or it was within the cord structures when they had marked so if that is a scenario then the answer is that this was a testicular vein next question patient presented with the neck swelling i think they given you the history then they given you some examination findings which kind of suggested that this was a solitary thyroid nodule question was pretty straight forward what is the first step in the evaluation of this nodule they have discussed this n number of times it is tsh okay if tsh was there in the option that is the correct answer otherwise thyroid profile now in our manipal medes app we have what we call as faculty connect videos where we make beautiful videos in 60 to 90 seconds like this instagram reel sort of videos which are jam packed with information for your exams in a very fun uh, way with lot of mnemonics and all so this was one particular thing which came right out of the um, faculty connect video so this was on evaluation of thyroid nodule i even labeled it saying evaluation of thyroid nodule in 90 seconds okay so in that i told you the first thing is to do a tsh and only if the patient is euthyroid or hypothyroid you are going to go ahead and do the rest of the investigations if the patient is hyperthyroid then we are going to go ahead with the radioactive iodine test otherwise the first test to be done is that of a thyroid stimulating hormone or the tsh if that is not there in the option thyroid function test will be the right answer this question was that from head and neck malignancies so they gave an image of a patient with a lesion in the lip now whether it is malignancy whether it is pre malignant conditions doesn't matter malignancy if it was an outright growth but if it was a lesion and they are considering it as pre malignant conditions like leukoplakia erythroplakia something of that if that had been given 
in both these scenarios the first one or the best way of diagnosing these two conditions is to do a wedge biopsy wedge biopsy now wedge biopsy basically means you are going to take a wedge of tissue like this like a pizza slice and you should take it in such a way that you are going to take the tumor and you are going to take a bit of the normal tissue as well okay now the idea behind it is that the tumor activity is maximum at this junction so you need to take a junction between the abnormal and the normal area now there was only one option or i think there was another option with normal mucosa but it was very vague so if that is a scenario superficial with normal mucosa will be the right answer either they had said superficial or they had said from the border from the border both of these will be the right answer all right you do not do a excision biopsy for such a big lesion you do not do an incision biopsy you are going to do a wedge biopsy next question they had put up an image of a patient with a bladder stone all right and uh, they mentioned that the patient had recurrent proteus infection and we have told you n number of times whenever there is infection then this is a phosphate stone now this i think was also asked in the inicet the recent inicet but there they asked regarding the kidney stone now bladder stone is basically an extension of the kidney stone so if phosphate was mentioned that becomes the answer but some students told me that calcium was mentioned saying calcium phosphate even if that is a scenario calcium phosphate becomes the answer in this particular scenario next they gave an image they had shown a patient who has undergone a procedure like this you can see that it looks a bit different the skin so the patient had undergone a skin graft okay he had undergone a skin graft procedure but that was not the question again i told you this image had no relevance the question what they had asked was that what is the source of nutrition or blood supply for this particular skin graft on day 3 on day 3 so on day 3 the source of nutrition or blood supply is through a process called as inosculation the first one or two days it is imbibition that means by osmosis by diffusion it picks up all the nutrients then the broken blood vessels will align with each other this is called as inosculation then new blood vessels are formed this is called as neovascularization and then fibrosis forms which kind of helps the graft stick that is called as organization now this was again straight out of our app i had mentioned this back then i had even written the number of days also here imbibition is the first two days inosculation is the second to fourth day when the vessels from the graft and recipients align with each other and form a temporary bridge for allowing the passage of blood and nutrients for the survival of the graft next they had put up an image i think this was in session 2 they, because they had already asked one case with pinectomy in session 1 they put up an image where a patient had undergone a total pinectomy scrotum was there scrotum was there and there were two drains like how you can see here right two drains in the inguinal region two drains in the inguinal region and that asked you to identify what is the procedure that the patient had undergone now orchidectomy definitely can't be the answer because the scrotum was intact and they could see the fullness there either way normally we do not do an orchidectomy for a penile cancer okay if they have done a penectomy very very unlikely that you are going to do orchidectomy orchidectomy is for testicular tumors not for penile cancers now the fact that there were drains in the inguinal region should tell you that this patient had undergone a inguinal lymph node dissection so the answer for this particular question would be total pinectomy with bilateral inguinal lymph node dissection next they had put up i think an image of a back dressing or it was a straight forward one liner where they had asked what is the ideal pressure for negative pressure wound therapy or the back dressing okay negative pressure wound therapy or the wack dressing the answer is 
to 125 millimeters of mercury now this is negative pressure okay it is negative pressure but of course in the option if they have not mentioned negative for any of the options then we have to assume it is negative so this falls into this particular range that is 100 to 130 millimeters of mercury and that was the answer for this question next was an again uh, image based question where they said that the patient had undergone a SPC suprapubic catheterization was done for acute urinary retention that means this is something significant normally for retention we pass the catheter through the urethra because we were unable to go through the urethra we have put it from the bladder on top so this tells that this is a urethral pathology okay urethral pathology and the follow up for this question was that they had given an image where there is a bladder some narrowing and then you could see the regular urethra the follow up was that what is the best modality of treatment for this patient now if it is a long segment stricture like that has been shown in this image if it is a long segment stricture the best modality is to do a urethroplasty with some sort of graft either the penile foreskin or the buccal mucosa some students told me buccal mucosa was mentioned so the answer becomes buccal mucosal urethroplasty if that is not there or if they have mentioned graft you can use that as well urethrotomy is done only for bladder neck narrowing or short segment this is done for short segment dilatation is never done dilatation is never done because of the fact that there is a lot of recurrence when you do dilatation so that is not done so the answer for this particular question was urethroplasty if buccal mucosa was there you should have mentioned it so this was again an image based question where they give you an image of a patient who's undergone fundoplication fundoplication and they asked you to identify what is the type of fundoplication so in fundoplication we have a few we have a total wrap i think they had given this particular image where it had gone completely and it is covering full 360 degrees 360 degrees or a total wrap this is called as the nissen's fundoplication okay total or a 360 degree wrap is called as the nissen's fundoplication again we have discussed this in our lectures we had put up this exact same image if it goes 360 degree you're going to call it as nissens if it is an anterior wrap that means from the front you're going but you're doing a partial wrap that is called as a doris and if you're coming from the back and you're doing a partial wrap then you're going to call it as a two-paced fundoplication next was an image of a patient where they had shown a trophic ulcer all right they had shown a sloughed out sloughed out trophic ulcer because they told there was a lot of yellowish material all around with a lot of slough and necrosis around and the reason why we came to the conclusion it was trophic ulcer was that they had also mentioned in the question that the patient had leprosy okay patient had leprosy and the base of the great toe or the foot whatever was mentioned and that put up an image like this with a lot of slough in that particular ulcer so it was a sloughed out trophic ulcer now we have told this when we discussed about wound healing what is debridement removal of dead and necrotic tissue is called debridement so if there is necrotic tissue you have to do debridement so the answer would have been debridement so whichever option had debridement in it that would have been the right answer here i think they had mentioned admit the patient debride and then give him iv antibiotics so without debridement you can't do anything else see you can give them foot care loose shoes ulcer care whatever it is but you cannot do it without removing the slough unless you remove that source of necrosis and dead tissue there is no point going ahead so the answer here will be debridement whichever option had debridement in it this is straightforward very easy that put up an image of a patient with an ulcer in the gaiters area gaiters area or the gaiters zone whatever we say this is in the medial aspect of the leg medial aspect of the leg and just above the ankle that is the medial malleolus 
So this is pretty straightforward. This is a venous ulcer. Okay, straightforward. We don't need to uh, discuss this too much. We have been learning this from our third term posting. From the minute we entered surgical posting, we have kept learning what is Gator's area, what is Gator's area. If there is an ulcer there, what are you going to call it? So this was pretty straightforward. Next was a question from the upper GI tract. So they said that the patient had undergone some sort of gastrectomy and which of the following vitamins must be supplemented for this patient. Now, please note that there is something called pernicious anemia. This is because of lack of intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor. So what is this intrinsic factor? This is something that is released from the stomach. That is the parietal cells of the stomach. They help bind with this vitamin B12 when they help in the absorption. So vitamin B12 absorption doesn't happen in the stomach. But without the stomach, the absorption will not happen because there is lack of intrinsic factor. So in that particular sense, if you look at it, any patient with gastrectomy, they will have vitamin B12 deficiency. So please supplement them with vitamin B12 in some other form. Now, if they ask you which is the most common deficiency, then it will become iron deficiency. Okay, but because iron is absorbed predominantly in the duodenum, so any sort of gastrectomy, you will bypass the duodenum. Nowadays, we have stopped doing Billroth 1. It's more or less the Billroth 2. So if you're bypassing the duodenum, they will have iron deficiency. But in this particular question, iron was not there. It was only vitamins. So then vitamin B12 becomes the right answer. Then there was one question on nutrition. So here there was some specific lines where they mentioned patient is critically ill diabetic patient and I think some people even told me the patient was metabolic syndrome. Patient had metabolic syndrome and then the patient was started on total parental nutrition that is the TPN and they said which is the most commonly seen complication in this scenario it is the hyperglycemia. So please note fluid overload hyperglycemia are the first two things that you are going to notice invariably I am talking about in practical scenario, invariably for patients with total parental nutrition, we even give them insulin infusion as and when we are giving the parental nutrition because their sugars can go as high as 300, 400. Okay. So along with it, we keep giving them insulin infusion as well to keep the hyperglycemia under check. Rest of it, you don't have to bother. This was again, I think a repeat where they had put up an image of a bladder which was opened up. So there was lack of fusion of the anterior abdominal wall. There was no anterior abdominal wall. Okay. So this is a part of the epispadias complex. So this is condition is called as bladder extrophy or ectopic vesicae. Okay. So both of them are the right answers, but whichever was there, I think bladder extrophy was mentioned that becomes the answer. In all the other conditions, omphalocele, gastroschisis or umbilical hernia, the anterior wall is formed. Okay, the anterior wall is formed, but there is a small defect through which the contents are coming out. In this particular condition, anterior abdominal is not formed at all. So anterior level layer of the bladder is not formed. You are directly seeing the posterior layer of the bladder. All right. You can even see the ureteric openings and you will see the urine dribbling out. So this is a case of bladder extrophy because here the anterior abdominal wall was not formed. And I have told this hundreds of times instruments, you will get a question. So as usual, they had asked one question, even in our INICT prepathon, when we did, we told you that they will ask you drains. They even went out to tell you what are the indications of drain, where it is used, where it is not used. Neat PG just took one step back. They put an image of a drain and they asked you to identify the type of drain, whether it's an open drain, whether it's a closed drain, in closed drain, whether it's a suction drain or a non-suction drain. This was that of a Romovac drain. Romovac is the name of a company, but as the name suggests, Romovac. Vac means vacuum dressing. That means negative suction will be there. So this was a negative suction drain. Penrose is an open drain. Basically, you're going to take a tube, put it inside the wound and let everything drain out from here or dribble out from this tube. That is called as a Penrose drain. So I think this was the last question from general surgery. So here they had given you components of a IV fluid. So 
I am not sure whether the exact values are given, but majority of, to of them told me that sodium was roughly 130, lactate was slightly on the higher side, that is somewhere between 20 to 30. So in this scenario where sodium is, is at 130 and lactate is at 28, the only option that you should mark at that point of time is Ringer's lactate. This is also called as a Hartman solution. So we discuss this again in our module where I had put up this table, where I had given you a list of all the IV fluids possible, all right, from 5% dextrose in water to Ringer's lactate, then uh, your isolite, then your half NS, your regular normal saline, 3% NS, and the various quantities. So if you see that in Ringer's lactate or your Hartman solution, it is 130 and lactate is around 20, all right. So this particular I think the composition what they had given belonged to the Ringer's lactate solution. So with that, we have covered all the questions that I could gather from general surgery or anything related to general surgery. Of course, there will be certain topics which overlap with the other subjects. Like there was one case scenario where they said there is discharging sinus from the foot. And what do you think the organism was? Of course, Dr. Meenakshi sir will be covering all that for you guys. Uh, so that was about general surgery. I felt it was a pretty okay paper, standard questions. But the only thing that kind of put off the students was that there were a lot of images. Okay, so it felt like that unless you have seen this in clinicals uh, posting, it becomes difficult to answer. But no, like I've broken it down for you, little bit of common sense, looking at the options, looking at the stem of the question, you should be able to break down the answer. And a lot of students that I spoke to eventually did mark the right answer okay by hook or crook got done and that's all that matters and um, i would like to repeat that we had a very good strike rate easily more than uh, 31 out of 33 i think 31 or 32 we had got from our particular module just one question which was not covered but we had done something similar to it but not the exact point uh, with regards to the material that we are giving out especially the faculty connect videos now, these videos are like I've already told you short Instagram, like lovely videos, which are power packed with a lot of information and they're basically nice to watch. They're fun because I had a lot of fun in making them. And the fact that the MCQs that we have created, a lot of them were straight out of the MCQs, including the words on the stem, the keywords and the options and stuff like that. Because here the MCQs are created by us only. We don't have students who sit and create the MCQs. No. We, the staff ourselves, sit and prepare the MCQs. So that is one of the plus points that we have in our app. And I'm actually proud that we were able to cover majority of these questions in this particular exam. So I hope you've all done very well. So fingers crossed for the results. And I hope to see all you guys on the other side. All the very best. Thank you.